The CISSP exam may include questions on a variety of laws and regulations that impact security, and the reason we need to focus on these in your exam preparation is that you're unlikely to have encountered most of these in your day-to-day -day life as a security professional. And they're mostly U.S. laws and regulations, but not entirely. And no worries, you don't need to be a lawyer to pass the CISSP exam, but you do need to be familiar with their impact to your decision making around security. So in the next few minutes, I'm going to walk you through the laws and regulations likely to come up on the exam and the key elements of each you should focus on to ensure you're prepared on exam day. So let's dive into laws and regulations for CISSP. So today we're talking laws and regulations as they pertain to the CISSP exam or legal and regulatory as it's called out on the exam outline. This content comes from domain one, which is security and risk management. The specific line item in the exam outline is understand legal and regulatory issues that pertain to information security in a holistic context. This means a wide array of laws and regulations, primarily U.S. law and regulations, with uh, a step over into a couple of European Union topics because they apply to U.S. companies. So just a bit of housekeeping here. If you're not familiar with the CISSP exam cram series, there are eight core videos that I made in early 2021 supplemented by the May 2021 update video to bring those all together and to ground you in those incremental additions to the 2021 exam refresh. So you'll want to make your way through these core lessons if you have not already, seeing really good results from these. And when you get done with the core, or if you struggle along the way, I have many shorter supplemental lessons. This is the ninth or 10th. And those videos range from hacking your exam prep, to memorization tips, uh, hands-on quantitative risk analysis formulas, which you must know for the exam, cryptography drill downs, physical security, attacks and countermeasures, and perhaps most importantly, mastering the CISSP mindset. Folks ask all the time, what does think like a manager mean? This video will quantify it for you. So have a look at these. Get with me if you have any questions. Use the official exam study guide, which includes lots of practice questions and flashcards. The 2021 edition is not out as of the current date, which is June 5th. I expect it's going to land in late June, but if you have the 2018 edition, I think you're more than fine to proceed. Just make sure you bridge the gap with some of this 2021 content, this fresher content. And there's a PDF copy of the presentation available in the video description. Do make sure that you subscribe and hit the bell so you get a heads up every time I drop one of these free videos. If you hit that thumbs up, it shares the, uh, the video out with your pals through the YouTube algorithm. Do check out the free CISSP practice quiz I have available for you. The link in the description, no login required. And with the housekeeping out of the way, let's get down to business. So in the legal and regulatory silo, we'll touch on cyber crimes and data breaches, laws that speak to transborder data flow. We'll talk about laws touching on licensing and intellectual property, including copyright, trademark, patent, trade secret, to name a few, all of which may come up on the exam. Several laws that relate to privacy and those that relate to import and export control. Specifically, you might see questions around restrictions related to exporting uh, certain encryption uh, technologies or other software to foreign countries or perhaps specific foreign countries. So there are three types of law with which you should be familiar for the exam. The first is criminal law, which is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, laws against acts like murder, assault, robbery, and arson, uh, or more simply put, laws that might wind you up in jail or prison. Civil law. So these are laws that address contract disputes, real estate, employment, uh, estate law, and, and probate. So think of these as laws that involve monetary disputes. So these are fights over monetary or money damages rather than criminal uh, affairs. And then administrative laws, which uh, administrative law defines standards of performance and conducts for major industries, for organizations and government agencies. And you'll find the government getting their hands in a lot of 
these sorts of regulations. And the CISSP exam focuses on security-related generalities of laws, regulations, investigations, and compliance. And I will try to point out the key areas that you should remember. But they focus on U.S. law. That's, that's really what we'll be focusing on here. We're going to step into a couple of European Union-related laws and regulations because those often affect U.S. companies. So let's start with the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which was the first major piece of, of U.S. cybercrime-specific legislation. And it made it a crime to access classified information or financial information in a federal system without authorization. It also made it a crime to perpetuate a fraud with a federal computer or to cause malicious damage to a federal system or to modify medical records in a computer uh, that impairs treatment. So the key takeaway here is unauthorized and malicious activities on federal systems. So these are federal or national uh, government systems as you might think of it. Federal sentencing guidelines were created to provide punishment guidelines that would help federal judges interpret computer crime laws. And they actually formalized the prudent man rule we discussed in another module when we discussed due care. In fact, if you go watch the CISSP mindset video, we dig into due care and due diligence uh, deeply. And federal sentencing guidelines really formalize that prudent man rule we discussed there. So it outlines three burdens of proof for negligence. So first off, that person accused of negligence must have a legally recognized obligation. So in the prudent man rule, senior executives have to take personal responsibility for ensuring due care that ordinary prudent individuals would, would exercise in the same situation. Uh, second, that person must have failed to comply with those recognized standards. They must have failed to take those prudent steps. And third, there must be a causal relationship between the act of negligence and the subsequent damages. So it's not enough for the person to have failed to comply with those recognized standards, but their failure to act or their actions must have caused the subsequent damages. That's what causal relationship means. So legally recognized obligation, recognized standards, and subsequent damages. If I was going to remember one thing about federal sentencing guidelines, I'd remember that they were designed to help federal judges. Uh, I'd also lock into my head that prudent man rule, do care. Uh, this really manifested some of those requirements. So let's talk about FISMA, the Federal Information Security Management Act. Say that fast three times. So FISMA required uh, government agencies to have formal information security operations, and it requires that government agencies include the activities of contractors in their security management program. So not just employees, when they hire contractors to do work, uh, they fall under those same regulations. This actually repealed and replaced the Computer Security Act of 1987 and the Government Information Security Reform Act of 2000. And we're not going to touch on either of those for that very reason. And NIST is actually responsible for developing the FISMA implementation guidelines. I will say I think it's pretty unlikely that the specifics of NIST guidelines for FISMA are going to be on the exam. Uh, I'd remember that this outlined a formal requirement for information security operations for government agencies and that it also included contractors. The Digital Millennium Copyright Act, so DMCA. So this covers literary, musical, and dramatic works. There is a precedent here for copywriting computer software, and it's done under the scope of literary works. And copyright law protects only the expression inherent in the computer software it protects the source code. And copyright ownership always falls to the creator of the work, except in works for hire. So what do I mean by this? Well, by default, the copyright is going to be owned by the creator of a work, except in the case where that person has been hired to create that work for an entity. For example, if you are a computer programmer for Microsoft or Google or Amazon, the work you create would certainly be a work for hire and copyright ownership would almost certainly not uh, default to you, would default to the company that hired you. 
Copyright protection is 70 years or longer, depending on the situation. It's 70 years beyond the death of the author. Uh, the first major revision of, of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act included uh, CD and DVD copy protections, those things that irritated many folks back in the, the days of, of CDs and DVDs, uh, preventing them from copying uh, material that they felt they owned through purchase. But copyright is the key here, and ownership, again, falling to the creator of the work. And we're going to talk about the length of protection again. I, I, it's important that you actually remember how long these protections kick in because it may help you pick the right answer on the exam. But we'll get back to that in just a moment. So let's talk more about intellectual property and licensing. So in addition to copyrights we have trademarks so trademarks are meant to cover words slogans and logos used to identify a company so a company's branding around its the company itself or its products or services so for example coca-cola or ibm and it's really intended to avoid marketplace confusion but you know through having companies or products with similar or even the same name Patents, which protect the intellectual property rights of inventors. So to secure a patent, uh, the intellectual property must meet three requirements. It must be new, useful, and not obvious. Trade secrets. So trade secrets uh, apply to intellectual property that is critical to a business and must not be disclosed. So the thing about a patent is that the protection is limited and you have to disclose the technology you are patenting. You've probably seen in the news where, for example, when I remember when Microsoft came out with their folding screen phone that was, you know, showed up in a, in a patent application. So with a trade secret, we can avoid the two biggest disadvantages of, of patents, and that is disclosure and the limited time a patent is in effect. And we'll talk about time limitations in just a moment so we can compare these. But trade secrets uh, are, are perpetual. They are indefinite. Licensing. You may see questions around four different types of licensing you're expected to know. So contractual licensing, number one, are agreements written into a contract between a vendor and a customer outlining the responsibility of each. So contractual means a written contract. Shrink wrap is the old school licensing that you'd see on a piece of paper that would come with shrink wrap software in the days when we bought shrink wrap software off the shelf at the local computer store. Uh, click through license agreements, those are really commonplace now and they, they show up in, in shrink wrap software as well where you, you click through and accept a few uh, requirements, clicking buttons indicating that you've read the end user licensing agreement, you agree to terms, etc., etc. And licensing around cloud services takes that click through concept to an extreme, oftentimes giving you, you know, the buttons to accept without making all of those details inherently obvious to you. They don't often, often they don't put all the details of the contractual obligations you have as a customer in front of you. So let's talk about the length of protections. I've mentioned this as being important a couple of times, so let's get, let's get to it. So trademarks have a protection of 10 years. Now, trademark protections can potentially last forever, but it has to be renewed every 10 years. Patents are 20 years of protection. It's generally granted for 20 years from the date the patent application is filed. You'll find uh, in the pharmaceutical industry, for example, uh, drug companies will make a new drug, they'll patent that drug, and then no one can, can copycat that for uh, a long period of time. Copyrights, so copyrighted works, 70 years. It actually lasts for the life of the author plus an additional 70 years, but 70 years is the minimum you'll want to know. And then trade secrets I mentioned uh, are indefinite. They can potentially last forever. That's intellectual property that's critical to a business and must not be disclosed. So import and export control. So there are two sets of governing regulations of interest for the exam. So the first is the international traffic in arms regulations. This controls the export of items that are specifically designated as military 
and defense item. So that, that's the key phrase there. So controls export of key technology used by military and defense. And then there is export administration regulations. Now this covers a broader set of items and this more focuses on the commercial space. So think of, of business rather than military, although items you know covered under export administration regulations could have military applications, but it's primarily designed for commercial. So ITAR is military, EAR is commercial. So, but they govern the export of sensitive hardware and software products to other nations, essentially. That, that's bottom line, what you want to remember here. So encryption export controls. Now, these regulations come from uh, the Department of Commerce uh, Bureau of Industry and Security. Now, it used to be virtually impossible to export even relatively low-grade encryption technology outside the U.S. So even, even technology that was not... Uh, exceedingly complex and, and had no relation to national security. You know, export was just more or less impossible. But with these controls now, regulations designate categories of retail and mass market security software that can be safely exported. And firms can actually submit new products for review uh, to the, uh, the Department of Commerce, and they will uh, go through an approval process. I believe it's, it's a 30-day uh, turnaround typically, but but never mind that. Just know that encryption export controls uh, restrict certain types of, of encryption technology from being exported outside the U.S. The Economic Espionage Act of 1996. And there's one very important element of, of this act I want to make sure you remember. So, so this act made theft of proprietary economic information and act of espionage. That's not the one thing, though. What's important is it changed the legal definition of theft so it was no longer restricted by physical constraints. So it made the theft of intellectual property. So, so it defines the term economic espionage as the theft or misappropriation of a trade secret with the intent or knowledge that the offense will benefit a foreign government or foreign agent. So we're moving from the world of physical into the world of, of electronic and, and ideas, intellectual property. Now let's delve into privacy. Quite a few laws and regulations around privacy. And the, the basis for privacy in the United States uh, starts in the Fourth Amendment uh, of our, our Constitution. So the Privacy Act of 1974 limited the ability of the federal government to disclose private information without prior written consent of the affected individual. So it, it provided U.S. citizens a degree of personal privacy. And then the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, the EPCA of 1986, made it a crime to invade the electronic privacy of an individual. So, so one individual or government agencies couldn't just go poking around in the electronic privacy, the electronic life of an individual without cause. And the Communication Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, CALEA, of 1994, actually amended EPCA to make wiretaps possible for law enforcement with an appropriate court order, regardless of the technology that was used, if it was phone or computer, etc. So we're, we're going on a bit of a journey here, and, and that's just the beginning of, of wiretaps. It, it goes further, as you'll see in just a moment. So continuing down the road of privacy, let's talk about the world of healthcare. So the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or as we call it here in the States, HIPAA, uh, laid out regulations requiring strict security measures for hospitals, physicians, and insurance companies. And in 2009, the Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act, or HITECH as we call it, updated many of HIPAA's privacy and security requirements. And it outlined uh, requirements for organizations that handle protected health information on behalf of a HIPAA-covered entity. So it extended with uh, HIPAA with some specific language around protected health information and extended the obligations to organizations that handle that protected health information on behalf of any HIPAA-covered entity. 
So for the exam, there are a couple of acronyms I want to be sure that you are very familiar with, and those are PII and PHI. So PII is personally identifiable information, things like your social security number, for example, and your date of birth, and then personal health information, which relates to everything related to your history of, of health care and beyond your patient records. So moving on in privacy, there is the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act, which focused on services uh, around with banks, lenders, and insurance, and it basically limited the services they could provide and the information they could share with each other. And then there's the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, or COPA. So you'll notice here again, I have the acronyms here. So, so lock those acronyms in your head. You may find those helpful. So COPA makes a series of demands on websites that cater to children. So, so think minor children, you know, individuals under the age of 18, and in this case really you know, typically well under the age of 18. And then there was also FERPA, which is the the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, which grants certain privacy rights to students older than 18 and the parents of minor students. So we're seeing here uh, a deepening of the the detail of, of personal privacy granted to individuals and special protection for children and those responsible for children. So so for COPA, remember it it's around websites catering to children. FERPA applies to students older than 18, so effectively adults, uh, as well as the parents of minor students. So, so FERPA was really dealing with, with two, two forms of adults, students over 18 and parents with minor children. All right, let's talk about the USA Patriot Act of 2001. This greatly broadened the powers of law enforcement organizations and intelligence agencies in the area of electronic surveillance and how the government deals with internet service providers, or ISPs, you might call them. And I think the real news here was what this did for monitoring electronic communications. It made it possible to obtain much broader wiretapping authorizations where previously law enforcement had to request uh, wiretapping one circuit at a time. Uh, the USA Patriot Act made it possible for law enforcement to obtain a blanket authorization for a person uh, to monitor all their communications to and from that person under a single warrant. So, so it went from a, a, a circuit level request to, to a blanket request was now possible. This became a law just a few weeks after the 9-11 attacks in 2001 on the, on the Twin Towers, a terrible event. But this act is still in effect today. So, so what sprung out of a specific event uh, remains in place 20 years later now. And continuing down that road of privacy, the Identity, Theft, and Assumption Deterrent Act. This makes identity theft a crime against a person whose identity is stolen, and it provides very severe criminal penalties, so lengthy prison sentence and, and very expensive fines. This came into law all the way back in 1998, so this has been around for quite a while. But Identity Theft and Assumption Deterrence Act. So that's where identity, you, and really the name says it all, right? This deals with identity theft. That's all you need to remember here. PCI DSS, Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard. So these last couple here, you won't find much on them in the official study guide. They may come up on the exam, uh, and, and they may be covered in greater depth in the 2021 refresh to the guide, but I wanted to call them out here because I, I think they are increasingly likely to be on the exam. So PCI DSS is a widely accepted set of policies and procedures that are intended to optimize security around credit, debit, and, and cash card transactions. And these were actually created jointly by the four major credit card companies. So Visa, MasterCard, Discover, and American Express got together and, and created these, these policies to govern security around these transactions. They certainly have a shared mutual interest there. And they're based on six major objectives. 
A secure network must be maintained in which transactions can be conducted. Cardholder information must be protected wherever it's stored. Systems should be protected against activities of, of malicious entities like hackers. Cardholder data should be protected both physically and electronically. Uh, if you watch the breakout session on physical security, we mentioned specifically there, there is no security without physical security, right? And networks must be constantly monitored and regularly tested. And finally, a formal information security policy must be defined, maintained, and followed. I wanted to call out these objectives. I think it's, it's not terribly likely you're going to get much in, in the depths of these laws, but know that PCI DSS applies to credit, debit, and cash card transactions. It was created by the credit card company. So if you get a question around law and, and uh, financial transactions, PCI DSS is, is likely going to be in your short list of answers. So I mentioned we have a couple of sets of regulations related to the European Union you want to be familiar with for the exam. So we'll start with the European Union privacy law which was a directive that outlined privacy measures required for protecting personal data processed by information systems. Uh, I think of this as kind of the original EU electronic privacy law. Uh, what was interesting about it is organizations based outside of Europe have to consider the applicability of these rules. So if a, a, an organization, a company outside Europe has customers within the EU, these rules would apply to them, generally speaking. Now, this was enacted all the way back in 1998. Now, much more recently is Privacy Shield, uh, which was an agreement between the US and, and the EU outlining seven requirements for the processing of personal information. Now, you know, amongst those seven requirements included informing individuals about data processing and providing free and accessible dispute resolution and cooperating with the Department of Commerce and maintaining data integrity and purpose limitations. So I don't think the seven elements of, of processing personal information are something you're going to be tested on, but you'll need to, to be familiar with the, uh, the spirit of what Privacy Shield covers but also the protections it affords companies who comply. So it allows the Department of Commerce and the Federal Trade Commission to certify businesses that comply with these regulations and compliant businesses that comply with all seven requirements are offered safe harbor from prosecution. So that's the key element here. And, and Privacy Shield actually replaced uh, the safe harbor regulations that were invalidated by the EU. And Privacy Shield was approved by the EU in July of 2016, so much more recently. Now here's one I would think is the most likely of these EU-related regulations to come up on the exam. So GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, was a comprehensive law covering the protection of personal information, and it applies to all organizations that collect data from EU residents or who process information on behalf of someone else who collects it. So applies to all organizations is key. So GDPR applies to anyone doing business with people within the European Union. And that's where GDPR had such a big effect on the world as everybody was rushing to, to be GDPR compliant as quickly as they could when that regulation was released. So there are some key provisions in there. There's a data breach notification requirement that mandates companies inform authorities of, of serious data breaches within 24 hours. Creation of centralized data protection authorities in each EU member state. Provisions that individuals will have access to their own data. Data portability provisions that facilitate the transfer of personal information between service providers at an individual's request. And then the right to be forgotten. I think of, of everything related to GDPR, the two things I'd remember is that GDPR applies to all organizations collecting data from EU residents or processing data for companies that collect data from EU residents. And that right to be forgotten comes up a lot. In, in discussion. So the right to be forgotten allows people to require companies to basically delete their information if it's no longer needed. 
And that's it for laws and regulation related to the CISSP exam. I hope you're getting value out of the series. If you have any questions related to this or any other session, just leave me a note in the comments or reach out on LinkedIn. Happy to help anywhere I can on your exam preparation journey. And until next time, take care and stay safe.